Uh, our next speaker is um, Dr. Nancy Lansdorf. Dr. Lansdorf is uh, Associate Clinical Professor of Physiology and Health at Maharshi University of Management in the USA. Her talk is going to be on chronotherapeutics. What's time got to do with it? A novel behavioral blueprint for transforming societal health. Nancy. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. I'd like to thank particularly uh, Anand Shivrastava every day. I thank him for providing the herbs that I use with my patients in the U.S. And also, please, please, please keep them coming. And uh, also the Ashtavijas who developed many of those herbs along with um, Vaija Trigunaji and Balraj Maharshi and Dr. Dvipedi. So thank you. So today, I, I, I would love to share stories of all the great results that I see on a regular basis with patients in the US, because I just want you all to know that Ayurveda is alive. It may not be widely practiced yet, but it's growing and growing in the US. And it is very effective for all sorts of conditions, as you know, that Western medical doctors have given up on. And I see that all the time, and I'm very grateful for this tradition and for Maharshi Ayurveda that allows me to, to be of help to my patients. So today I'm going to talk about uh, another topic, another aspect of what we do in Ayurveda, particularly with the modern world and modern schedules. I'd like to start by just saying uh, a patient of mine who's 64, and lives in Cal Southern California. She was only five feet three and weighed 95 pounds and reported she ate a pretty good diet. So I was very, very shocked when she told me that she had quite um, moderate to severe atherosclerosis and her carotid arteries were quite, quite clogged up. And I thought, how could this be possible? She eats well, she's thin, she's active, you know, what could possibly be the problem? Well, when she told me about her sleep pattern, it became clear to me, all the alarm bells went off in my Ayurvedic brain, oh my gosh, this lady barely sleeps. She had trouble sleeping, so she would, even though she would go to bed, she'd wake up maybe three, four hours later at two, three in the morning, couldn't sleep, so she'd just get up, and she was going constantly. So I, I gave her the best lecture I could on improving her sleep habits, and knowing that that's one of the hardest things to change, of course, I gave her herbs and other things as well. But being very sensitive to those things, she wrote me a couple months later that she actually found that the best advice I gave her was for sleep. And I just wanted to read uh, a few uh, words that she wrote me to underscore how important and irreplaceable the kind of advice Ayurveda gives and the knowledge about our daily routine, how important it is for health and how we really have to begin as a society and as medical doctors and as a health conscious community to pay attention and start to live according to the Ayurvedic principles. So she said, I learned I can heal and recover by taking active steps to simplify my life. I made a pact with myself to stay in bed from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. no matter whether I was sleeping or not. And she says, I'm happy to report I have an improvement in my sleep. She said, my digestion has also improved because I now eat smaller meals during the day instead of one large one at night. So, so, and snacks throughout the night. That's actually, I think, how she got the cardiovascular disease. She had quite a bit of ama. She says, I've always prided myself on being strong and resilient, and I'm happy to say that I feel I'm on the right path to living a healthier lifestyle. So small kind of fulfillment, but one that I got from that because I saw that a lady really changed something that was going to make a big difference in her health. So let's start with the first slide. Here, I'm proposing that time does matter, and I will try to stick to the time. No woman is an island. Oh, excuse me, no man is an island either. We live in a, an ecology. We live in connection with every other thing in the universe, and everything is affecting everything else. And that's probably one of the most important premises of Ayurveda. So we know we have circadian rhythms. We have cortisol rising in the morning and dropping during the day and 
now we've learned many other circadian rhythms. And lunar rhythms, particularly women, are, are aware of that. And then there's also solar and seasonal rhythms, which are a really fertile area for, for research because we really don't pay much attention to that in modern life yet. But give it another 10 years and they'll discover the rest of Ayurvedic chronology. So here we go. Um, the sun affects our biological rhythms primarily through the main timekeeper or biological clock, which is in our suprachiasmic nucleus, which is in the ventral part of the hypothalamus. And it's right above where the signals coming from the eyes travel through the optic nerves to the occipital cortex in the back of the brain. So basically, the hypothalamus is eavesdropping on the light that's coming in through our eyes. And it is, while it has its own rhythm, if you put us in dark, we will still go on um, cycles of maybe 25 hours or so. That's why circadian, circa, about, about 24 hours. But the light every day does entrain our biological rhythms. So we have the suprachiasmic nucleus, and then a discovery in the last 10 or 20 years has just become really known popularly that almost every cell in our body has some clock genes. So it's not just the brain that knows what time it's, it is, it's everything else. And in fact, our behaviors are also influencing all these peripheral clocks. And in fact, right now, probably half of the audience is circadian disrupted in that we have jet lag. So our suprachiasmic nucleus is having to adjust. And so are all the other local clocks in our liver and our pancreas. So good to eat light. We have this wonderful light food here that's so delicious. <laughs> Thank goodness. So uh, we have also at that level where the unmanifest is becoming manifest, as it was so beautifully described this morning, we have the function of the three doshas. And this is a great secret weapon of knowledge that we have in Ayurveda that is a completely different dimension that no other alternative or complementary or functional medicine has that adds such a power of healing to what we do. So Ayurveda says, Vayo ahoratri bhuktanam teant madhya ariga kramat. So this is a saying in the Ashtanga Hridaya that basically says, that the vata, pitta, kapha are sequentially predominant in the beginning, middle, and end of age, meaning our lifespan, day and night, and after meals. So what that means is saying that we have a circadian rhythm that we can predict with the knowledge of the doshas, and that, for example, metabolism being highest when the sun is highest in the sky, that's the time we should take our main meal of the day. And when the sun comes up, and naturally we're starting to wake up, or our brain wants to wake up. So that's when we should get up. So we have this uh, clock, the dosha clock, that we're also familiar with. Now what I'd like to do is, when I started in Ayurveda almost 30 years ago, none of, this was all kind of hearsay. It was like, well, take it on faith, because Ayurveda is its own authority, as Maharishi said this morning. But it's so fulfilling that over these decades, modern medicine has started to catch up with research on what might have seemed before to be irrelevant topics, but are really important for health. So I wanted to just review some of the research that's starting to validate these principles. Um, here's Marcy, though. In the meantime, difficult as it was to cut down on her caffeine consumption, Marcy strictly observed her self-imposed limit of one cup per day. <laughs> But for, <laughs> for those of you who like coffee, it does have a half-life caffeine of about 10 to 12 hours. So you eat it in the morning, drink it in the morning at 8 at night, you still have half that caffeine. It depends on your metabolism, but you're never really free of it till the next day. So Ayurveda time guidelines, you know, we all know this. Main meal at noon, bedtime by 10, exercise in kapha time. These are the ones that I'm going to uh, address with the research. So first of all, this is the slide that details a discovery fairly recently. This article was published. Oops, I'm very sorry about that. The um, slide is overrunning the reference. If you want it, I'll get it for you. But this was done just about, I think, two years ago, and it was published in, in International Journal of Obesity. And they took 420 subjects 
and they put them on a diet, all of them. They gave them 20 weeks to lose weight, and they had half of them eat their main meal of the day after 3 p.m., and half eat before 3 p.m. So who is the winner? Well, they had equivalent caloric intake, of course, and those that had their main meal before 3 p.m. Um, lost weight faster, and they lost more total weight. So obviously there's some metabolism that is at play that Western science has not been privy to. I mean, the concept was, we've, how many of us have heard over the decades? It's just how many calories you eat. It doesn't matter what it is, and it doesn't matter when you eat it. Well, that's just plain not uh, the whole story. Bedtime also. Bedtime is an important uh, principle of Ayurveda, to go to sleep during this kapha time by 10 p.m. So what this study showed is that, first of all, there's a big problem out there because basically over half of, of young teenagers are not getting enough sleep, and almost half of them can't stay awake easily at school. This study looked at over 15,000 early teenagers, and what they found was they actually did a study where they imposed a bedtime uh, to control for other matters. So the parents imposed either a 10 p.m. bedtime or they let them stay up after midnight. And what they found was that those who stayed up after midnight, midnight were 24% more likely to be depressed, which is a huge issue in teen health right now. Um, and also 20%, which is off the slide, are more likely to have suicidal ideation. So it's a very big influence on the brain neurotransmitter balance when we go to sleep. Uh, now it's not just, now that study didn't control for total sleep time versus time of bed, bedtime. So it left open the question, but this study did address that issue. It looked at total sleep time versus bedtime. And what they found, a uh, similar group of students, and what they found, what, they've tracked them over six to eight years after, and they found that total sleep time itself was not really related to the grade point average or emotional distress. But late school year bedtime, going to bed late during the school year, later than 11.15, was associated with a worse educational outcome and emotional distress six to eight years later. That's when those, many of those kids are already in their 20s. So that's a very important developmental time to make sure your kids are going to bed early. Fine. Uh, another study, now looking at exercise at different times a day. This was in prehypertensives, which is kind of borderline blood pressure. And it looked at the concept of, of the dip in blood pressure while we sleep, which is associated with less cardiovascular disease, that the, the mind, the brain, the nervous system, and the cardiovascular system are relaxing during the sleep, and that our blood pressure should drop and give our cardiovascular system rest. So they had people exercise at different times of the day. And interestingly, this is what they found. Those people that did their 30 minutes of exercise at 7 in the morning or 7 p.m., versus 1 p.m., the pitta time. So kapha time in the morning or afternoon, evening, they had a greater drop in blood pressure during the night. And isn't that interesting? Because there's the idea that, well, you shouldn't exercise in the evening because it keeps you awake. First of all, I saw one study that showed that that wasn't the case for most people in that study. But also that this, ca this is kapha time again. So here's some evidence that the actual time of exercise makes a difference in exactly the way that Ayurveda would predict. And same for the diastolic blood pressure as well. I like this term. This was actually the title of this uh, study, Bedtime Misalignment Increases Breast Cancer Risk. And what they did was they, um, they actually recognized that there are night owls and morning larks. Maybe by habit, maybe it's okasatmya, as my friend um, Dr. Stuart Rothenberg states, that anyone who grew up in New York has a, naturally a biorhythm that is set for an 11 or later bedtime. Um, so this, they studied 85 women with metastatic breast cancer, and they typed them for the, those women who preferred early versus late bedtime, and then they watched and saw when they actually do go to bed. Do they go to bed according to what they say works for them? And what they found, they measured their disease-free interval, in other words, before they had a recurrence. And those that were aligned with their natural circadian rhythms lived almost seven years free of disease, whereas those 
who were, say they were people that really feel better when they go to bed early, but they stayed up because of whatever, whatever, um, they actually only lived uh, not quite four years disease-free. So this is something that's being discovered by cancer researchers and taken very, very seriously because there aren't probably many chemotherapy drugs that make a difference that big. And what they did here was another study. Um, it, they found that 50% of metastatic breast cancer patients are rhythm disturbed, and that's associated with fatigue, loss of appetite, sleep disorders, and poor disease-free interval lengths. And they, they basically prescribed chrono rehabilitation. In other words, go see the Ayurvedic doctor and do what they tell you. So exercise at the right time, take your meals at the right time, have light exposure, sleep, and also the medication should be given at the time that's right for the body. And that's a whole other story that we won't get into today due to time constraints. But the administration of chemotherapy at the proper time can make a difference two to tenfold in the tolerability of the medication given. And most chemotherapy drugs are either most effective and least toxic at like 6 in the morning, 6 in the afternoon, or from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. Now, they don't have many clinics that are working at those times. So that's probably why we haven't changed the practice. But these researchers are looking into timed infusions that people can give at themselves at home so they can get the drug when it's going to be least toxic and most effective. So we're almost done here. So, and basically, it's also not good to be jet lagged and try to conceive. Uh, Drosophila, the fruit fly, has lower egg production when it's eating at the wrong times as opposed to when its day night cycle is. So, this desynchronization of the body clocks within the individual leads to less fertility and probably less fitness as a whole. Uh, one of my last slides here health equals swastya and established in the self, and this gentleman is establishing himself in his big self, S, uh, the inner silent transcendental level of himself. And here is some research you'll probably see again later, uh, Dr. Robert Schneider's landmark study on the reduction of death, heart attack, and stroke with transcendental meditation. Uh, in patients who've already had a heart attack, they're at high risk for recurrence, very high risk. You could see as much as 10% of these people have another event within five years. Um, oh, actually, even per year, the event. And then the Transcendental Meditation Group, who were taught TM versus a health education control, had nearly half of those recurrent heart attacks and strokes and death. A really, really a dramatic, amazing result, I have to say, because most drugs and cholesterol medication doesn't do anything near those results. So what is the message here? We're talking about Maharshi Ayurveda, transcendence, the experience of timelessness. Direct contact with the least excited state of awareness is the most powerful means of promoting health from the Chark Sanhita and that complete transcending of mental activity, the silencing of the mind, is the best among the sources of health and happiness. So follow your Ayurvedic routine and make being timeless for 20 minutes twice a day part of that. Thank you very much. <laughs>